Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today, we're taking a look at Borderlands 3 performance with around 60 different GPUs. I think it's around 60 anyway. Kind of lost count there in the end. Anyway, it is a boatload. I've spent the last three days doing nothing but testing the game, and that means lots of blue bar graphs. For all this testing, I will be running the game in the DirectX 11 mode because I found overall it was smoother than DX12, which is still labeled as beta and is therefore in development. I will just note that we have had at least one Patreon member tell us that the game ran better on their RTX 2080 Ti using DirectX 12, but neither Tim nor myself experienced that. Still, it may pay to check out DirectX 12 if you're having trouble getting the game to run smooth using DirectX 11. On that note, I highly suggest checking out Tim's excellent optimization guide, which was posted on the channel yesterday. It has some great tips for massively improving performance without noticeably sacrificing visuals. Now, for testing, I'm not using the built-in benchmark. In the end, I decided against it, and we generally try to avoid canned benchmarks when possible. So for testing, I'm using the Propaganda Center, but performance-wise, it appears quite similar to the numbers you'll get with the built-in benchmark anyway. And please note, in this footage of the benchmark pass that I'm showing you right now, I'm not trying to show off my mad gaming skills. This is just a benchmark pass, and not a tutorial on how to rip headshots like a boss or whatever the kids say these days. We've also had a few reports that the game hammers the CPU quite a bit, and we suspect the DRM is to blame for that, though it is mostly quad-core owners that are complaining about horrible stuttering, so that's something to be aware of if you do only have a four-core processor. For testing, I am, of course, using our Core i9 1900K test system clocked at 5GHz with 16GB of DDR4-3400 memory, as this is primarily a GPU test. For the NVIDIA GeForce GPUs, the GameReady 436.30 driver was used, and for AMD, the Adrenaline 2019 Edition 19.9.2 driver. Both are optimized for Borderlands 3, so make sure you're running the latest driver. Finally, I've tested the game using the ultra quality preset at 1080p, 1440p and 4K, but again remember to check out Tim's optimization guide because it is possible to boost performance by around 50%, again without sacrificing visual quality. And then finally, I also retested with a few GPUs at 1080p using the medium preset, and I've thrown in a heap of older GPUs there as well. Alright, so for this content I'm going to use the long scrolling graphs. I haven't used these in a while, but last time I did, you guys seemed to really like them, so hopefully that's still the case. Starting from the top, we of course have the RTX 2080 Ti, and here it pumped out an average of 122 FPS, which for 1080p doesn't seem all that high. The RTX 2080 and 1080 Ti were limited to around 105 FPS, which again, doesn't really seem that high. This is the kind of performance we'd be hoping for at 1440p. Moving on, the RTX 2070 Super was 9% faster on average when compared to the 5700 XT, which is a pretty typical margin and a good result for the Radeon GPU. The 1% low result was also slightly better for the 5700 XT. Then a little further down, we see that the standard 5700 averaged 80 FPS, making it a little faster than the GTX 1080, and much better when comparing the 1% low data. Unfortunately, I don't have the RTX 2060 Super for comparison right now. Tim has taken that card for an updated look at ray tracing, and the same goes for the 2080 Super. So sorry about that, but hopefully uh, Tim's updated look at ray tracing will be worth having those cards absent from this testing. Now, we see when compared to the standard RTX 2060 that the 5700 was 8% faster, so not a huge margin there, and that really means that it should be comparable to the 2060 Super in this title. As you might have expected, Vega 56 matched the GTX 1070, while Vega 64 was a smidgen faster, placing it just behind the 1070 Ti. The GTX 1660 Ti does really well here, basically matching the GTX 1070 while beating the old GTX 980 Ti, the flagship GPU from a few generations ago now. The vanilla GTX 1660 gives the RX 590 a pretty hard time delivering 12% more frames, and that's quite good given it now costs about 10% more. The 1660 also averaged over 55 FPS in our test, whereas the 590 fell below 50 FPS. Okay, so now we've made our way down to the GTX 1060 and RX 580 at just under 50 FPS. And even the 3 GB model of the 1060 does pretty well here at 1080p. The old GTX 970 does okay with 41 FPS, but we are seeing just 39 FPS from the RX 570, and I expect that newer part to perhaps do a little bit better. And then I'm going to wrap this up at the GTX 1650. We're really at the cutoff point here, and you'll want to start optimizing the quality settings for better performance. 
Next up we have the 1440p results and here we're starting at 90 FPS on average with the RTX 2080 Ti. So that's comparable performance to what you'll see in a title such as Assassin's Creed Odyssey and much worse than what you'll see in something like The Division 2, Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Metro Exodus, which again, I don't think it's really justifiable for a game that looks like Borderlands 3. I mean, it's a good looking game, but compared to those games, not sure yet you can justify those frame rates. Then we see that the standard 2080 was 21% slower, rendering 71 FPS on average, and we see a further 7% performance downgrade with the 2070 Super. This time the 2070 Super was 11% faster than the 5700 XT, but again, that doesn't really justify the 25% increase in price. The standard 2070 and non-XT version of the 5700 were comparable in terms of performance, pushing frame rates into the mid 50s. Then right on the cusp of 50 FPS, we find the GTX 1080 and RTX 2060. Dropping below 50 FPS, you'll find GPUs such as Vega 56 and 64, along with the GTX 1070 and 1660 Ti. Then once we get down to the GTX 1660, you'll really need to reduce the quality settings for better performance. A lot of these GPUs averaged around 20 to 30 FPS, and that's really not an ideal situation for PC gamers. Jumping up to 4K hammers performance as you'd expect, and now even the RTX 2080 Ti can't achieve 60 FPS on average. That said, with Tim's optimizations, the 2080 Ti should be good for a little over 70 FPS on average in our test, and in fact, that's exactly what you can expect to find. Using the hub quality settings, the 2080 Ti averaged 72 FPS for a 53% performance boost. I would have done more testing with Tim's quality settings, but by the time I had the information from Tim, I was already like 50 GPUs deep into my testing. Anyway, what this means is with the optimized quality settings, you're able to push near 60 FPS at 4K with the GTX 1080 Ti or RTX 2080. Just lastly, I retested a few GPUs with the medium quality preset while I also added a heap of lower end GPUs to the mix as well. Here we're seeing a massive 80% performance improvement for the GTX 1660 when going from the ultra quality preset to the medium quality preset. And that's in line with Tim's 70% claim using a mixture of high and low end GPUs. The GTX 1060 saw a 75% performance increase and is now pushing 82 FPS on average at 1080p. Interestingly, the RX 570 saw a massive 109% performance uplift when downgrading the quality preset from ultra to medium, though we did only see a 78% increase for the R9 390. But describing that increase as only 78% may not be the best choice of words here. We also see some older GPUs such as the GTX 970 performing really well with the medium quality preset, and the R9 290 can also be seen hanging in there quite comfortably with 67 FPS on average. There's also a relatively new GPU that I haven't talked about too much, and that's because it was too slow using the ultra quality settings, and that GPU is the GTX 1650. With the medium quality settings, it averaged 65 FPS, which is decent. That said, for less money, the RX 570 was almost 30% faster, and this is why we've always recommended gamers avoid the budget Turing-based GPU and just get the RX 570 instead. Still, the 1650 was much faster than older high-end GPUs such as the R9 280X and GTX 770, but yeah, they're really quite old at this point. Still, they did average 50 FPS at 1080p, so that's quite an impressive result really. And there were loads of other GPUs in this performance class as well, such as the R9 380X, the 7970, 1050 Ti, 680, 1050, 380, and 680. For an average of 40 FPS or better, you'll need a Radeon HD 7950 or GTX 960. So there you have it. That's how Borderlands 3 performed for us using a range of GPUs with the ultra and medium quality settings. It is a real shame that the game's presets are so bad. Uh, you really need to tweak the settings manually and doing so can lead to around a 50% boost over the ultra quality results shown here with no noticeable downgrade in terms of visuals. So make sure you check out Tim's quality settings guide for Borderlands 3. I'll chuck a link to it in the video description. As I noted earlier, quad-core CPUs do seem to be getting maxed out in this title, and in the future I might do some CPU testing, or at the very least feature Borderlands 3 in some CPU reviews. As for memory, you'll also want 16GB of RAM for smooth performance. We often saw total system usage around 7GB, with the game itself consuming around 3GB. 
As for VRAM, 4GB appears to be fine for 1080p. The 3GB 1060 did well enough in our testing, but we have a high-end system that might be masking any performance issues with that configuration. That said, you can even get away with 4GB at 1440p, but naturally for gaming at 4K, you'll want at least 6GB of VRAM, but GPU horsepower is more the issue at 4K, and high-end GPUs have well over 6GB of memory these days, so it's somewhat of a non-issue. Anyway, that is going to do it for this one. If you like the video, don't forget to slap a like on it for us. You can also subscribe for more content. And if you want to gain access to our exclusive Discord server where you can ask Tim and myself any questions directly, then check out our Patreon page. Link is in the video description. There are some other cool perks as well, such as our monthly live stream and behind the scenes videos. Also, you can now grab Harbour Unbox merch like this, like this cool hoodie. So that's, again, link for that is in the video description. And finally, Thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.